My friends at Easy Cater are workplace catering pros, helping you find food for everything from daily employee meals to staff meetings and special events. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hi, I'm Jody Reed, and one of my favorite quotes is, if service is beneath you, leadership is beyond you. The Leader Assistant Podcast exists to encourage and challenge assistants to become confident, game-changing leader assistants. Are you tasked with ordering food for your office? Let me tell you about Easy Cater. With over 100,000 restaurants to choose from nationwide and 24-7 customer support, Easy Cater helps assistants like you and me succeed at work and makes our lives easier. Visit easycater.com slash leader assistant to find out more. Hey friends, welcome to the Leader Assistant Podcast. It's episode 235. You can check out the show notes at leaderassistant.com slash 235, leaderassistant.com slash 235. And today I'm excited to be speaking with Jody Reed. Jody has been an assistant for over 30 years, uh, specifically an executive assistant for five years. And she's been with Ag Professionals. Uh, I, think, I hope I said that right. We'll let her correct me uh, since 2015. And she supports the CEO slash owner and two other executives and then manages the office and a small team of assistants. So Jody, welcome to the show, first of all. And it sounds like you have your hands full at this company. I do. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I do have a hands full. Did I say it right? Ag professionals? Ag professionals, yes. Ag professionals. All right, cool. And then uh, what part of the world are you in? I'm in Greeley, Colorado. We're just north of Denver. Love it. Love the Denver area. My brother lives there, so I get to make it out there once or twice a year. And uh, just love the weather and the mountains. So I'm a little jealous. I will, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little jealous. It is pretty here. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your, uh, you, you personally, do you have dogs, cats, um, ferrets, uh, you know, a garden? Uh, do you like a certain Netflix show right now? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I have a dog. I have a basset hound named Fred. And I have two grown children. Um, I don't really have a favorite Netflix show. I don't watch a lot of TV. I read a lot. So, what's the fa- what's your favorite book? This one's a nonfiction, but my favorite book is "Living, Loving, and Learning" by Leo Buscaglia. I read it every year. Interesting. Every year, huh? Wow. Every year. Yep. I've worn out a copy. So, "Living, Loving, and What Learning?" Learning by Leo Buscaglia. Wow, I'm going to have to uh, put that in the show notes as well, because if you read that every year, then it must be worth putting in the show notes, right? He was phenomenal. I wish I could have heard him speak. He taught a class called Love um, at University of LA, I think. Or... Okay. So. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. I'll have to check that out. Uh, and then, you know, you've been assistant for a while, and we're going to talk about your hobby here in a minute. But tell us about how you got into the profession and maybe why and what you like about it. Um, My mom was an admin for 50 years with the same company for 35. And so I always joke that I learned it through osmosis and it just kind of. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And so I started young, uh, right out of high school as an admin. This is horrible to admit. I typed 10 words per minute back in the day. (laughs) so And I just stuck with it. I enjoyed it. I enjoy being supportive. I like that helping people, the pleasing people was a long time ago part of it, but I just, I enjoy helping and I feel like I help Hmm. and it's different every day. It's not the same thing day in and day out. Yeah. That's one of my favorite parts. Um, So how did you end up in the agriculture? culture industry then? Uh, Luck. (laughs) Um, I worked for a water district here in Greeley and I knew the owner 
and one of the other execs that I support now. Um, and I dealt with them for probably 10 years. They would, we developed dairies, feedlots, those sorts of things. And so they were bringing in some dairies into the local area and doing the development and they needed water. So I dealt with them quite a bit and I always loved working for them. They vie for the client. And I loved that they always were pushing for the client and never took no for an answer without being bratty about it. Mm -hmm. And I loved that. I loved how much they put the client first. And I always used to tease them. If you ever have an opening, I want to come work there while well, they had an opening. And this is, I didn't start it as an assistant there. I was their projects admin coordinator. So it was pure luck coming to work for them. I just adored them and knew I wanted to work for them. Nice. Yeah. And what's maybe, you know, I've talked to a lot of assistants in different industries, finance, retail, um, you know, family offices, venture capital, software, et cetera. I don't know that I've actually interviewed it. If anybody, it was maybe one uh, from the agricultural, you know, industry. Um, is Have you noticed anything about this or do people, you know, as you're networking with other assistants in other industries, is there, is there like a major difference uh, to your role that, you know, would be interesting to share? Uh, we're a lot more casual. We're very small. We do have two offices in two states. So I support people in other states too. So um, maybe being small and being ag, I feel like it's a little more casual. It's a little more laid back. It's well, it's fast paced. It's not like a super intense fast pace. And I don't have a board to deal with, with being here or anything like that. So hmm. nice. Cool. Well, you know, I've talked about this a lot in my trainings with assistants where I talk about how if we as assistants care more about being comfortable uh, then versus taking risks, then we're not going to really be able to lead well. We're not really going to be able to reach our full potential. And we're also not going to encourage others to step outside of their comfort zone and one thing that I think I posted on LinkedIn and I said, Hey, you know, what's your hobby? And you commented saying drag racing. And first I was like, Oh, okay. You know, drag racing, like you like to watch it on TV and go to the races and, you know, the whole community vibe, whatever. Uh, and then you, you know, you clarified, Oh, actually I, I, I drag race, like I drive the cars myself. And I was like, what? We got to talk about this. So, <laughs> so I want to hear like from the beginning, like what happened? Why did you decide to do this? What kind of pulled you into the drag racing world? And then we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty. So in high school, we street raced, but this was a very long time ago when there wasn't a whole lot of population here in Greeley. And it was a little <laughs> as taboo and horrible as it is now. But um, so I've always liked it, gone to them. Uh, my ex-husband actually has a hot rod shop and builds cars and had built his car and at Bandemir. And I don't know for those that don't follow drag racing Bandemir, this is their last year. They're on a mountain. It's, you know, they're a mile high. So it's hard to tune cars. It's a unique situation. So we were at Bandemir and they have a class called Nitro Knockouts for just women. And you can get in your daily driver and go down the track. <clears throat> Had a friend. She races a very, very fast car. Got in the car with me because it goes slow enough that you could have someone ride with you. Mm -hmm. To show me how to do the tree. And because I was very intimidated by the, the tree, the Christmas tree, the lights. And it was 22 seconds down the track. It's probably the slowest I've ever gone in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I was hooked. And I came running back up to the pits and said, I want a race car. And a year later, not quite a year later, I had my own car. Wow. So that was how that started. I, I instantly fell in love with it. It's not as easy as it looks. It looks like you just get in there and punch the gas and you go. Right. But it's, <laughs> it's called bracket racing is the class I race in. So you have to guess your time. You have to know your time. So you get two time trials. And then you have to say what you're going to run, like how long my car usually runs in 1140. So 11.4 seconds in a quarter. Mm -hmm. So I have to guess how it's going to be. And then you 
your light, you're timed on your light. So your reaction time from when it turns green and you go. And if I'm slower or faster than the car, one of us leaves before the other. And then at the at the finish line, you have to judge who's going to cross that line first closest to their time without going faster than your time. Uh Yeah. So it's not just go and whoever hits the line first, there's a lot of like play at the big end and you have to let off and judge. And interesting. Yeah. That was, that's the hardest part. I really do think that's the hardest part of all of it. The tree is easy now compared to that. (laughs) Wow. So the tree is the, the lights and then you just go right. And then it's whoever wins. Well, I'll leave. Yeah. One of us leaves before the other, unless our times are the same. Okay. Okay. So for the first year that I raced, I had the slowest car in our class. So there's a time range. I think it was the cutoff was 1299 is the slowest you could go to 999, I think on the other end. So 9.9 seconds and a quarter mile. And so I was the slowest in our class. So I always got to leave first. So I always got chased. Mm. And so that it was actually very helpful to learn how to run that big end. So I would leave if they were running a 10 second, I got almost full three seconds before they could catch, you know, before they could leave the light. Mm. Interesting. So, so have you had any uh, scary moments uh, where your car messed up or you crash or anything like that? No crashes. I had um, what we called the death wobble. So I had my um, tie rods and um, were breaking, but we didn't know that. And so I had my Mm. front end wobbled pretty violently. So that was a little scary. But other than that, no, I was always lucky. I I don't go fast enough really compared to some of those big cars. So, yeah. Hmm. So what, what have you learned from your experience drag racing that's helped you in your job as executive assistant to a CEO? So my whole life, I wouldn't try things because I wanted to be perfect at it, to do it in front of people, a job, apply for those sorts of things. And so you don't get to be perfect at drag racing. Everybody starts at the bottom and even the really good ones aren't, don't have perfect days. So when you're up there at the light and you're afraid you're going to red light or you're going to, we call it sleeping at the light. So your reaction time takes forever. Um, You make mistakes every day on the track and everybody does. So it wasn't, it taught me how to just step outside my box, do it. It doesn't matter what everybody else is thinking or wondering, because they're really not thinking or wondering about if I'm messing up or not. And so it just taught me to go ahead and try. And I speak my mind with my boss now and ask questions and ask to learn. And he's supportive of those things anyway. Mm-hmm. But it's really helped me just to step outside and try. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So have there been times in your, well, first of all, when you're drag racing, do you get nervous? Oh, terribly. <laughs> <laughs> oh so, yeah. So are there times in your EA career when you're nervous? And in, and has there been times like, I guess my question is, are you more nervous, you know, during those seasons or in those certain moments, have you been more nervous drag racing or being an EA? EA. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the drag racing, I'm only on the track for just over 11 seconds. So it's not that long. And so everything else is a little bit longer in comparison. <laughs> mm, that's true. So like you walk in and you have a nervous situation at work, usually it doesn't last that that short. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Is there anything that any el- anything else, you know, personally or professionally that you would like to share with assistants of the world? I say step outside your box. I know that there's a a quote or a cliche quote that everybody says, you know, life begins outside your comfort zone. It really does. And had I not tried, I would still be stuck and not be in the position I am as an EA and further along and have the trust with my boss if I hadn't have stepped outside my comfort zone to try. Hmm. Well said. So another another note is, you know, you mentioned in your bio that you manage the office. So a little bit of office management, I assume, and then also a small team of, of assistants. 
tell us a little bit about how you manage that. You know, you support the CEO plus two other executives plus the office and, and, you know, do you lead the team of assistants? Are you kind of like the team lead or? Yes. And I never wanted to be a <laughs> supervisor <laughs> or a leader. And he, my boss finds it amusing that I am now. <laughs> um, and I have a great team, so I don't really have a whole lot of managing to do per se. I have a really great team. We work well together. So, but I do <clears throat> um, encourage them to do, you know, personal development webinars, trainings, those sorts of things. But as far as like the work product, I don't have, they're just amazing. So there's not a lot of that. Yeah. Managing the CEO is more difficult than them. <laughs> <laughs> naturally, naturally. Um, awesome. Well, Jody, thank you so much for being on the show. And it's it's really fun to chat with an assistant uh, who has been in the same company for um, a while. And, you know, what, what would you say? How long have you been at, the, at this company? I was trying to find your LinkedIn real quick. Almost eight years. Eight years. What, what's been maybe the stay staying factor, uh, if you will, uh, that's kind of kept you excited about being at the same place for that long? Our culture, for sure. We have an amazing team. And I also like what we do, you know, food is necessary. Got to have it. Um, so the fact that we are in the, basically the food industry, mm -hmm. just the beginning stages of it. Um, I love that part too. And I love that we, vie for farmers and their rights and their right to farm. And so that makes it encouraging as well. But yeah. most of it's our culture. We have an amazing team and an amazing CEO who cares about us. So, and it shows. Nice. What's maybe one tip on cultivating and creating a good culture? I laugh a lot. I smile a lot and I encourage everybody else to as well. And I try to, I'm, you know, as an executive assistant or even as an admin, you seem to be the, the go-to for everybody in the office when they're having a good moment, a bad moment, a personal moment, whatever. And I always try to make sure that they know they can come to me for that. And then we just encourage working together while we have meetings and an open form of communication at all times. Hmm. Nice. Well, is there a place, Jody, that people can reach out and say hi or um, or connect with you? And and would you be up for them doing that if they would like to? Yes, my LinkedIn is fine. I that's that works great best. Okay, cool. Well, I'll put the link in the show notes for sure. Leaderassistant.com slash two three five. Leaderassistant.com slash two three five. And also link to that living, loving, learning book that you recommended. Uh, again, excited to check that out. And yeah, best of luck to you and your drag racing and uh, your career. And thanks for being on the show. And I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate your time too. Thank you very much. Please review on Apple Podcasts. GoBullows.com